Hi, welcome to uh, my lecture uh, for Anderson's uh, book, Private Government, uh, Chapter 2. Uh, before I get going, just let me say that I expect this to be a fairly short lecture, about a 35-minute or 40-minute lecture. Uh, but if it goes on a bit longer than that, I will uh, provide like breakpoints in, in the caption to this video so that you know nice places to stop in case you don't want to you know, eat this, uh, eat this lecture all in one bite. Uh, anyway, so let me just jump in. Uh, so, and, so Anderson's book, Private Government, you know, th at the heart of it is these two chapters. In the first chapter, Anderson explains to us uh, how what she describes as some, as, as, well, what I've been describing as a free market ideology is uh, so, something that fit very well with egalitarian concerns uh, before the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but then her point uh, that she suggested, that she kind of raised, broached at the end of chapter one, is that that ideology actually does not fit. Uh, the contemporary uh, economy very well, and that in fact uh, cl clinging to that ideology as it was presented uh, prior to the Industrial Revol Re Revolution, uh, clinging to that ideology today when economic conditions are very different and modes of production are very different, she's you know she's argued as a kind of a pe uh, pejorative ideology. It's it obfuscates some you know very key things that make that particular ideology. Uh, not suited to uh, contemporary institutions. Now, in this chapter, uh, Anderson's main goal <clears throat> is to explain <clears throat> what has changed. She's tried to get very clear on what is different about uh, contemporary modes of economic production. Uh, and w w what she wants to explain is that the Industrial Revolution made a really important change in the nature of this uh, production, namely the nature of the kinds of organization, the kinds of forms of human organization that are you know, best suited to produce uh, in, under these new conditions. Uh, so, so she explains this in chapter two, and one, and one of the key concepts she uses is this idea of private government, the, the, uh, the, which is the name that she's given to both this, uh, that she's given to uh, this book. Um, so one thing we need to do to understand what's going on in this chapter is get clear on what Anderson has in mind when she's talking about government, what government is for her. And so she says that government exists uh, wherever some have the authority to issue orders to others, backed by sanctions in one or more dom domains of life. And by authority here, she doesn't mean legitimate authority necessarily. What she means is whenever, when, whenever there are some people who present themselves as having authority, and may, they, may, may, they may or not actually have legitimate authority, but they present themselves as, as having that authority, and they uh, issue orders, and they're systematically able to back up those orders, get compliance with those or orders by way of sanction. Now, one of her points is, is that the state is merely one form of government among others. And I think in uh, previous readings, we've seen something like this. We've seen uh, uh, descriptions from Bain and from uh, Lerner and from Scott, uh, and, uh, and to a lesser extent from Rousseau, about relationships that aren't necessarily the state relationship, uh, but relationships, say, within the family, or between, the clerg between clergy and parishioners, uh, and so on uh, are between, say, uh, uh, lords and their serfs, where there is a kind of a authority relationship here, where the authority is backed by the, where the claims to authority are backed by sanction, and this, and not all of these things are the state. Now, remember the idea of the state, the key feature of the state that's unified a lot of our discussions about the state is uh, is Max Weber's idea that the state is this compulsory organization that asserts a monopoly on determining the legitimate use of force over a territory, where that force is primarily used to you know secure compliance with the rules uh, issued uh, by the state. Now, that's just one kind of organization where you might have a, a government, uh, as Anderson describes it, a relationship of authority, as uh, Anderson describes it, where it's systematically backed by force. Uh, so just to, 
Anderson interestingly illustrates her point by saying, look, Today, we associate the term government with the state, you know, the Canada uh, government or, uh, or maybe, you know, police forces and courts and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, she, one thing she points out is that historically, uh, English speakers have used this term to refer to a much broader set of institutions. And what she references is this letter from John Adams, the first, I mean, the second president of the United States, uh, to, uh, to Abigail, so, someone who just basically... Uh, well, it was just in a kind of exchange with Adams. So, you know, in essence, this, this isn't quoting from uh, Abigail's uh, uh, question to Adams, but in essence, it's something like this. Dear John Adams, please remember the ladies. So, of course, uh, and what she's talking about is like, hey, uh, we're now uh, back, you know, at the founding of the United States, creating this new form of government. Uh, please remember that uh, women are seeking to uh, remove the yokes of those who would constrain them. Uh, women would like liberty uh, as well. Uh, but then John, John Adams responds to this, uh, 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 and, and he says, We have been told that our struggle, the American uh, Revolutionary Movement, We've been told that our struggle has loosened the bonds of government everywhere, that children and apprentices were disobedient, that schools and colleges were grown turbulent, that Indians slighted their guardians and Negroes grew insolent to their masters. But your letter was the first intimation that another tribe, more numerous and powerful than all the rest, were grown discontented. But depend on it. We know better than to repeal our masculine system. Uh, now, I, I mentioned this uh, uh, I, I bring up this quote for a number of reasons. One is because it makes uh, Anderson's point about uh, how government was, you know, they use the term government and government to describe, you know, all these relationships of authority that they were familiar with, you know, not just the state. Uh, but also I raise it because, you know, you can kind of see the connection between some of the course themes where somehow these authority relationships, these government relationships, are closely associated with different sites of domination. Uh, uh, you know, the, the relationship between uh, Negroes and their master in the early American uh, uh, political community, but, uh, between Indians and settlers, uh, but, uh, you know, and on and on. Uh, but then, of course, you know, the, the relationship that Lerner focused on, the relationship between men and women. Um, now, as we're going to see, for uh, Anderson, government does not entail domination. Uh, we have to be careful here about the relationship between government and domination, at least as Anderson uh, understands it. Uh, but government definitely raises the risk of domination as, we, as we've been understanding it here in this course. Okay, so just to, I'm not going to go through this particular slide, but if you'd like, just review it for different things that we might consider government, governments, and we might kind of, we might consider the ways that in these different domains, uh, the authority, the, the, the entity that claims authority is capable of backing its authoritative directives with, uh, with a threat that secures compliance. And the threats are different in different circumstances. Uh, one one thing I will call attention to is that you know the the state does have particular sanctioning uh, capacity uh, uh, abilities at its disposal that other governments don't. They can do things like imprison folks more easily uh, and use force against them more easily. But uh, there are other domains that, uh, but but that doesn't mean that there aren't sanctioning uh, abilities of in these other domains as well. Okay. Now, an, another set of ideas that's crucial to Anderson's discussion in Chapter 2 is her distinction between uh, the public and the private. Uh, she, so on her account, she thinks, well, well, one thing to say is that this is kind of a vexed notion in political philosophy. You know, how, how do we, in a principal way, dis to distinguish between the things that are in the public sphere and things that are in the private sphere? Uh, you know, on one sort of intuitive way of, uh, of cutting this up, we might say that the uh, household or the way that your house is run is in the private sphere and all the states that the, all the things that the state does, like putting parks together and so on, that's in the public sphere. Uh, but she doesn't quite cut it up this way. She has a much more nuanced idea of this distinction between public and private. So, uh, so here's Anderson on this. 
if something is legitimately kept private from you, that means it is none of your business. Uh, this entails at least one of the following. You are not entitled to know about it. Your interests have no standing in decisions regarding it. You aren't entitled to make decisions uh, uh, regarding it or, or to hold those who do accountable uh, uh, or hold those who do accountable for the effect their decisions have on you. Anderson goes on, if, if it is private to you rather than private from you, that means it is your business and you may exclude others from making it any of theirs. This entails at least one of the following. You are entitled to keep others from knowing about it. You need not consider others' interests in making decisions regarding it. You are not accountable to others for your decisions regarding it. You are entitled to exclude others from making decisions regarding it. Okay, now notice some interesting implications of this way of distinguishing between private and public. Uh, so now let's think about you know, this paradigmatic example of something that's in the private sphere. In the private sphere, uh, uh, so, 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 uh, this paradigm exa example is the household. Now, I might say that what's going on in my household is private to me, uh, or at least to me and my family. And that means it's my business, and it's not any of yours. We get to make decisions about you know, how we organize our chores and all that sort of stuff. But it's, none, uh, it's not anyone's business in the you know, amongst the members of the class. Uh, that I'm teaching right now, you know, how we should conduct our household business, uh, you know, so long as it doesn't affect you in some way. The idea is that uh, my, what goes on in my household is private to us, the members of this household. Uh, but then notice that uh, there's a sense in which what happens in the household is public as well. It's not strictly private. So, uh, so think about the household as a whole. Um, so, you know, the household, there's my, my kids, and then there's my wife, and there's me, and uh, within the household, uh, I, I couldn't say that the decisions about the household and what goes on are private to me. Uh, I could say that they're private to me and my wife and maybe my kids too, but when we think about uh, the household as a whole, uh, the, the decisions uh, between, you know, me and my wife those decisions are not private between the two of us, meaning that the decisions about how the household is run is something that neither of us can legitimately keep private to ourselves. Uh, rather, how the, house, the decisions about how the household are run is things that uh, uh, both of us are entitled to know about. Both of us have interests and standing to, you know, to have a say in those decisions. Uh, so there's a sense in which the household is public to its main constituents, uh, you know, my wife and I, uh, and to a lesser extent, my, you know, my kids who are 10 and 11. Um, but, but the idea is that there's a public dimension even within these households. It's a public dimension that reigns over all the people who are, whose business is the decisions of the household. Okay, now we can think about the state in the same way. Uh, uh, Anderson's idea is that the state is not, uh, there's, a, there's an important sense in which the state is a public government. And what that means is that uh, all the citizens of the state uh, are, are entitled to having a say and having knowledge of uh, the decisions that the, the officials of the state make. The decisions of the officials is the public business. It's not the private business of the uh, high-level officials, or at least that's what most of us think, uh, given our place in history uh, uh, after all the uh, after the emergence of a kind of democracy, starting you know way back with uh, well at least with Adams, uh, and who we referenced earlier uh, in the, in today's lecture. So here's what Anderson says. But of course, the association of the state with the public sphere is not inherent. It is a contingent social achievement of immense importance. The centuries-long struggle for popular sovereignty and republican form of government are attempts to make the state a public thing, something that is the people's business, transparent to them, servant to their interests, uh, in which they have a voice and the power to hold rulers accountable. Authoritarian governments insist on the opposite, that the affairs of state are the private business of the rulers. 
So to situate this within the themes of the course, uh, you know, the old uh, grain states that we've been talking about, you know, all the way up until, well, about the 18th century, were uh, presented as private governments, where only the folks at the very top uh, were entitled to uh, know the state's business and make decisions about the state's business. The democratic revolution, uh, uh, most recently, is one in which uh, the public has demanded and secured some degree of access to this decision-making process, making uh, the state a public government rather than a private government. <clears throat> so, uh, to recapitulate a bit of what we said, uh, Anderson says that you are subject to private government whenever you are subordinate to authorities who can order you around and sanction you for not complying over some domain of your life and the authorities treat it as none of your business across a wide range of cases, what orders it issues or why it sanctions you. So something to be clear about is that uh, all, uh, any government satisfies one in this slide. Uh, you know, you have a government when it, whenever there's one set of persons who are subordinate to authorities who can order them around and sanction them. But what makes a, a government private is whether the authorities treat those decisions, you know, about what those orders are going to be, and if, whether they treat those decisions as uh, their own private business as, a, as opposed to the public's business, one which, you know, demands democratic input. Now, the punchline in Chapter 2 for Anderson is her claim that the workplace is a private government with a great deal, you know, today's contemporary workplace, the one that we work, you know, that, that most of us work in today, uh, is a private government with a great deal of power to affect the shape of ordinary people's lives. Anytime there's a private government, it must, and then the, the, the further thought is that anytime there's a private government, it must be justified for basically the same reasons that apply to the state. Uh, so, uh, so you know, one thing I encourage you to do, uh, if you haven't done it already, is read closely, like the kind of opening uh, uh, pages of uh, the opening pages of chapter two, where Anderson does a kind of bait and switch. She describes this form of organization where there's a kind of totalitarian, dictatorial control of the lives of the people that are participants in it. And then at the end, she says, oh, guess what? I've been describing the contemporary workplace. Uh, I, and that's supposed to come to a surprise uh, for most folks, because most folks don't think of themselves as living under uh, uh, the domination of a, a private government. Most folks in contemporary so-called democracies think of themselves as living under a, a public government. But her punchline, her point is, well, that's sort of true, but for most of your everyday life, uh, that isn't true uh, for most folks in uh, contemporary societies. Okay, now, uh, something that I should uh, remind you of is some of the interests that uh, Anderson thinks are at stake in uh, relationships of government. Uh, and this applies to state governments and workplace governments, all, the, all these governments. And the idea is that when you have one set of folks in an authority position with respect to others in a position to uh, systematically sanction and effectively sanction the other's behavior, uh, then there are a whole bunch of important values that are in play. Now, some of these values have to do with these notions of equality that we've been talking about in, uh, in this particular Rousseauvian tradition. So when you're, in a, when you're in a relationship, when you're governed by an authority like this, there's a real question of whether your interests are being taken equally into account. Because, of course, there's going to be this tendency for unchecked authorities to discount your interests when making the rules. Uh, of course, there's also this question of an equal say. If some folks are making the decisions, there's worries that the folks that are required to be obedient aren't getting to have a say in how their social world is organized, you know, what they're asked to do. Uh, and then there's also this worry about the kind of esteem, the status that goes with these different positions. There might be a really devastating loss in status for folks who are systematically accorded uh, the subordinate position in these government relationships. Uh, finally, there's this notion of Republican freedom, which is broadly associated with the Rousseauian tradition we've been talking about. There's this uh, value of trying, to, of, of trying to find a situation in which, one, which no one is dominating you, where you're not subject to anyone's arbitrary, unaccountable will. 
Anytime you have a government uh, relationship of any sort, be it in the household or the workplace or the state or, you know, your football team or basketball team or whatever, there are worries that uh, these, uh, these values won't be given their due. Uh, they're implicated. And, that's, and it's values like these that are thought to be, for many folks anyway, the reasons why we thought, at least in the political sphere, that it's important to have a state that's checked by a democratic procedure. Another thing that Anderson does in Chapter 2 is she gives an example of why private governments in the contemporary workplace have persisted. Why it is that despite the fact that we uh, highly value considerations of egalitarian concern, equal concern and respect, equal say, equal esteem, we're concerned with this value of non-domination. Why those values that have moved us to try to put a political system in place that has some democratic checks, uh, why those haven't values haven't moved us to do something similar in uh, with respect to the private government, or with respect to the workplace where we have a kind of government. Um, her explanation has three basic parts, uh, and I'm going to go through all these three parts. I'm going to just state them quickly here on, uh, with this slide. Uh, first, uh, we have to get clear on this idea that we've discussed at great length uh, already from Chapter 1, but we're going to you know, add a, a few little bits here and there. That, uh, to, uh, the idea is that economies of scale destroyed Smith's and Payne's and Lincoln's vision of a marketplace and policy populated largely by self-employed agents. Uh, and you know these are agents that didn't relate to each other in, under an authority relationship. Rather, these are agents in the world these folks are imagining. These are agents who related to each other by way of just contracts out in that marketplace where I just sell you goods and services uh, you know, in, in a kind of a case by case manner, you know, I'll take my wares to the market and I'll sell them to you, and you'll and uh, and you'll do the same with your wares or your services. Uh, but it, but it won't be like this permanent permanent authority relationship. The idea is that Smith, Payne, and Lincoln had this idea that very few folks would work would live in the marketplace under an authority relationship. But as we'll see, economies of scale um, made it very unlikely that. We were going to relate to each other uh, out there in the marketplace in the way that they had in mind. There's the second idea of the theory of the firm, and the theory of the firm is an explanation of uh, 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 it, 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 it's a fine grained explanation of why, after the Industrial Revolution, it's it's just it, there are too many reasons to ignore for organizing economic production under a coordinated authority structure. Then the third is uh, a term that Anderson co-ops, uh, uh, a metaphor for a, a pejorative ideology. I, we haven't, we've been blinded by ideology to the need for public government in the, re, uh, in the workplace. And the term she uses to, the metaphor she uses is a metaphor to something that she describes as hemiagnosia. Uh, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing that. But anyway, this is this inability to, that, that's very rare, but there, there are occasional cases where uh, persons are unable to detect what's going on in a, in a particular side of their body. Okay, so let's start with this first thing, this idea of economies of scale. And here I'm just going to read Anderson to you. She, she makes the point just really clearly. Uh, so she says that the technological changes that drove the Industrial Revolution involved huge concentrations of capital, like you know all the capital that's needed to put a railroad system in place, all the capital that's needed to put uh, you know some gigantic uh, steam-powered uh, 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 textile factory into place. Uh, so so she says a steam-powered cotton mill, steel foundry, cement or chemical factory or railway must be worked by many hands. The case is no different for modern workplaces such as airports, hospitals, pharmaceutical labs, and computer assembly factories, as well as lower tech workplaces such as amusement parks, slaughterhouses, conference hotels, and big box retail stores. The greater efficiency of production using large, indivisible capital inputs explains why few individual workers can afford to supply their own capital. It explains why, contrary to the pro-market egalitarian hope, the enterprises responsible for most production are not small sole proprietorships. So mom and pop, you know, can't deliver, cannot uh, run a steel foundry on their own. Rather, you need uh, 
you know, you need hundreds of people to go work at, uh, at a steel foundry or a cement factory or what have you. Uh, you need lots and lots of people to work together to be able to get the uh, to, to be able to justify the enormous capital expense of bringing in the equipment to produce you know these various kinds of things, and also uh, the way of using the, this capital. Uh, it, it makes sense uh, with a whole bunch of folks operating the capital in a coordinated way, as opposed to folks just you know carving out little bits of it uh, in a sort of a mom-and-pop fashion. Okay, so the idea is, th th this whole idea of yeoman farmers, artisans, all working in this uh, competitive uh, marketplace of small little units of self-employed people, that just can't happen uh, in present levels of the technology. Uh, so you're going to have to have economies of scale. Uh, now, there's this further question, okay, you have economies of scale, you have to have a lot of people working together. Now there's this further question of, well, why do we, they have to work together under an authority structure? Why does there need to be an authority who sets the rules and everyone else obeys? Well, she cites, uh, Anderson cites Harold Demsett's theory of the firm to explain this, and she agrees with this. She thinks this is basically right. Uh, and here she is talking about this theory of the firm and its implication. Economies of scale do not explain why production is not managed by independent contractors acting without external supervision who rent their capital. Okay, so let's consider two models. One model might be like, look, we've got this big steel factory, right? We've got this uh, with, you know, all, you know, this giant production floor with, uh, with uh, uh, the furnaces and all this sort of stuff. You know, one model is that you have a bunch of independent contractors in there uh, who are organized in a way that's different than a model where everyone's an employee working under some uh, set of managers at the top who have authority over everyone. Uh, let me say a little bit about what an independent contractor is to help you, you know, see how this model uh, might work. Well, it won't work. It can't work. It would be a mess, but at least they'll understand it in, in theory or in concept. So you guys are all familiar with independent contractors, I think. An independent contractor is someone who doesn't work for you. Rather, they're someone who performs a discrete task for a price and is negotiated on a case-by-case -case, uh, basis. So, for example, you might hire an independent contractor to come landscape your yard. I'm trying to do that right now. We just moved into a new place. And so you go, you know, you, you find people who are landscape engineers and you hire them to do this job. And, and you know, you work out a contract together that specifies everything that's going to go into the job and then you may pay a price. You might hire a plumber in a similar way. You know, uh, there's, but the, but the key idea is that you are not the boss of them basically but what it is is you enter into a contract with them for what they're going to do for you and once that contract expires they they you know they're done doing that service for you and they go find someone else to contract with um now uh, the idea so then you know let's think about this in the context of a steel mill you might have a whole bunch of contractors in a steel mill and in the steel mill each contractor would produce a part or stage of the product for sale to other contractors that are at that steel mill at the next stage of production. The final contractor would sell the finished product to wholesalers or perhaps back to the capital suppliers. Uh, Anderson notes that some New England factories operated on a system like this from the Civil War, from the Civil War to World War I. But that doesn't work very well, and Anderson explains why. The independent contractor model was superseded by hierarchically organized forms namely firms with bosses who tell other people what to do as opposed to uh, you know firm a model uh, forms of organization where everyone just contracts every step of the way the independent contractor was superseded by hierarchically organized firms according according to the theory of the firm this is due to the excessive costs of contracting between suppliers of factors of production in the failed New England system independent contractors faced each other in a series of bilateral monopolies which led to opportunistic negotiations. Uh, the demand to periodically renegotiate rates led contractors to hoard information and delay innovation for strategic reasons. Independent contractors wore out the machinery too quickly, failed to co tightly coordinate the production with workers at other stages of production, leading to excess inventory of intermediate products, and lacked incentives to innovate, both with respect to saving materials and with respect to new products. So the idea is that 
for it was much more economically efficient to rather than having a whole bunch of independent economic producing units to meld them all into one giant unit uh, that's authoritatively organized by a central command and control system that's what the modern corporation is you bring all this together you don't have a marketplace within the firm the firm enters into marketplaces with other people outside of the firm but within the firm there isn't a marketplace you rather you have this authority structure uh, people are organized and production is organized not by way of case-by-case uh, -case contract the production is organized by way of the central command and control model and uh, Anderson's point is the central command and control model dominates most of our working lives. Uh, the state isn't organized this way, for, uh, uh, at least large parts of it aren't organized in this way, uh, but, uh, uh, but the, but, I'm, I'm sorry, the marketplace is not organized in this way. This larger marketplace is not organized in this way, but there's an internal production within firms that is organized in this way, and most of us live under that command and control structure, or one like it. Okay, so Anderson's idea is that the modern firm solves all these coordination problems by replacing contractual relations among workers and between workers uh, and owners of other factors of production with centralized authority. A manager or hierarchy of managers issues orders to workers in pursuit of centralized objectives. This enables close coordination of different workers and internalize the benefits of all types of innovation within the firm as a whole. Authority, authority relations eliminate the costs associated with constant negotiation and contracting among the participant in the firm's production. Okay, so now let's be clear. Uh, let's sum up uh, uh, you know, some of these threads. We'll pull some of these threads together now. Anderson claims that all governments, private and public, are constituted by authority relationships. Public governments are ones in which the governed, those who must obey, have input into the decision-making. Their say counts. Fully egalitarian governments are ones in which the say and interest of each member of the government public count equally, uh, where there are no faults, according to greater degrees of esteem. Uh, her point is that most of us live in workplaces that are organized in a command and control system that is a private government. It's not a public government. It's, it, it bears very few of the features of a public government system. And as a result, these egalitarian values uh, and this concern with non-domination is that uh, uh, they are all in jeopardy. Okay, now this final uh, account of Anderson's explanation of uh, why it is that we still see today private governments in the workplace despite, uh, despite the bearing of those governments on these values that we seem to hold so dear, these egalitarian values and these values uh, regarding freedom that we seem to hold so, hold so dear. And she, she uses, the, the final bit of her explanation employs a metaphor. Uh, she, this, the axis of this metaphor is this, this phenomenon, hemiagnosia. And this is patients who can't perceive half of their bodies. And the idea is that uh, some libertarian thinkers uh, today, and, but this is actually a thought that's kind of disseminated broadly throughout the public, you know, kind of taken up. Uh, 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 there's this thought uh, that that disables us from perceiving the part of the employer-employee relationship that occurs after this initial labor contract. So Anderson's going to acknowledge, like, yeah, there is at one point in all of this uh, organization there is a contract or, or an agreement anyway. There's an agreement uh, between the employer and the employee to enter into the authority relationship. But what they lose sight of is that this contract is very, very different from the contract that you see in Paine's or Lincoln's or Adam Smith's ideal of case-by-case uh, -case contracts where people are out in this private, uh, this, this big marketplace on relatively equal footing, making contract after contract, selling one another, uh, selling goods and services to one another. Because the big difference is that this uh, contract is a contract to enter into an abiding 
uh, authority relationship that goes on and on after time once that initial contact is, fir is formed. Uh, because of the theory of the firm, it's necessary for people to organize in this way. This, con uh, this contract, this one contract, this waiver contract, is an agreement to enter, un to, to enter into such an authority relationship. Uh, but what, what, uh, what Anderson says these, this line of thought doesn't appreciate, is blind to, is that this is a one, that the main feature of this relationship is the authority relationship. Uh, because the agreement to enter into the labor contract is just one little moment in, that precedes, you know, potentially years and years of this authority relationship. Moreover, she points out that very unlike the folks with relatively equal standing and bargaining power out there in Payne or Lincoln's or you know Smith's uh, marketplace of, of self-employed folks, artisans, and so on. In this case, the bargaining relationship between employers and employees is abidingly you know weighted in favor of the employers, and it's that you know it's that particular transaction that defines the contours of this authority relationship. And so, so Anderson's big point here is that for, for whatever reason, we've widely adopted this set of ideologies that are this ideology that blinds us to these features of uh, contemporary production, of private government uh, in the bulk of our working lives. Okay, at the very end of uh, chapter two, uh, Anderson describes and, you know, begins to assess various ways of, of trying to redress or to, you know, mitigate the threat that workplace private government poses to uh, our egalitarian values and our, and our commitments to liberty. Um, she can, so she canvasses what she takes to be some main options, says a few words about why she does or doesn't like each of them. Uh, and I'm just going to point these out. Uh, this situates with, you know, later material in the course, because in, we're going to read other authors who kind of amplify and elaborate on some of these possibilities, where the goal is to do something about uh, the realization of these values in the workplace. So one possibility would be, well, why don't we just end government of any sort in the workplace and try to make, you know, return to something like Smith or Payne or what have you uh, had in mind, uh, return to something that looks like an independent contractor model where everyone's on relatively equal footing. And then Anderson just quickly can say, well, we can't do that because the cost in terms of efficiency of production would be way too high. Uh, but here's some other things we can do. One thing we might do is try to just strengthen the bargaining power of the employers, make it to where they get a little bit closer to that equal footing in this, you know, this pivotal transaction about the shape of the authority structure in the workplace. And there's a few things that we could do to uh, increase, increase this bargaining power. You know, one thing we could do is, like we saw in the Great Compression era, we could have a government, uh, a state government, that tries that makes full employment as a goal of the state, and this would increase the bargaining power of workers. You know, workers would be able to say, "Hey, I'm just going to go find this other place of employment if uh, if you don't give me the deal I want." Uh, that might help. Uh, we might do things in the United States. So, in the United States, one of the big deals is is that healthcare uh, insurance is tied to your employment status. So one way you might go to help the United States with this, uh, increasing the bargaining power, is, is not to tie employment to, uh, to health care. Because uh, that way it would be easier for workers to exercise their option of exit and threaten to leave uh, if they don't get the deal that they want. Uh, another possibility would be to put a universal basic income in place, which would sort of put a floor on the deals that uh, workers would be willing to accept from their employers. Uh, another one would be to get, this is really common in the United States, 
uh, is to get rid of non-compete clauses. And, and, and I think this is an issue in Canada as well, but I'm not quite as sure of that. Uh, and this is something that, you know, in, of all places, this is something that's been popping up lately. This has always been a thing that you could see out there in the working world uh, and, you know, in, in, in employment law. Uh, but it's recently cropped up to target places like working at McDonald's or working at some fast food places. There are a lot of fast food places that require their employees to sign contracts that say, if we fire you, you can't go work for another fast food restaurant uh, uh, for, you know, X amount of time. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, non-compete clauses like that really impede employees' ability to ex exit, and it really affects their bargaining position. Okay. So that's one. So so we so now so here we've considered two possibilities how we might try to address uh, the threats to egalitarian values and threats to freedom uh, uh, posed by government in the workplace. One possibility is to try to increase uh, the possibility to augment the, the availability of the exit option to employees, thereby increasing their bargaining position with their employers. Uh, giving, m making the making the whole thing more responsive to their interests than it would be otherwise. Another possibility is to do something that Anderson calls rule of law uh, constraints, and these would be ways of trying to uh, uh, strengthen uh, the ability. Or, uh, these are these are ways of just creating something that be that would functionally look a lot like a charter of rights and freedoms for the workplace, which is here are some things that the employers are not allowed to do and the state's going to enforce this uh, to make sure the employers don't run afoul of these various uh, principles and freedoms. Uh, so, you know, human resources handbooks can, you know, enumerate a bunch of these kinds of things. Uh, there might be state laws that just say, look, the working conditions have to be, you know, up to this level, or uh, you can't discriminate in certain ways. And you have state laws that say, here are just things you cannot do uh, in a workplace. Uh, part of making all this work, uh, points out Anderson, is to uh, make sure that you don't have uh, a, a kind of regime that is known in the United States as an employment as at will uh, arrangement. Uh, in an employment at will arrangement, the the employee can fire the uh, I mean the employer can fire the employee for any reason. They need no cause. Uh, when you have an arrangement like that, uh, this is most southern states in the United States. In fact, I think it's the majority of states in the United States now. When you have an arrangement like that, it makes it very hard to enforce any of these. Uh, rule of law type uh, freedoms uh, conditions because the employee the employer never has to state exactly why they're firing someone and they could be firing someone in order to uh, you know get around uh, uh, the enforcement of the these various requirements enumerated say in a human resources handbook or maybe even these state uh, sanctioned uh, employee prote protection provisions Okay, now the final way that uh, Anderson considers that we might want to uh, uh, shore up egalitarian values and values of liberty in the workplace uh, against the threat of uh, private governments is to try to democratize the workplace, uh, to try to install some sort of employee voice in the workplace. Now. Anderson does not go into a great deal of detail about how this might work, but she does point out uh, certain uh, certain uh, uh, ways this might go. Certain, you know, a variety of different models of workplace democracy. So first, Anderson says, look, boys can more readily adapt workplace government rules to local conditions than state regulations can, while incorporating respect for workers' freedom, interests, and dignity. Just because workplace government requires a hierarchy of offices does not mean that higher office holders must be unaccountable to the governed or that the governed should not play any role in managerial decisions. This is the same logic as applies in a democracy. Just because we need legal officials and police and legislators doesn't mean that we can't make all those people uh, accountable to uh, the folks who are governed by the decisions of, the, of those legal officials. Uh, same thing goes in the workplace. You know, why can't we make uh, the workplace managers accountable to uh, the, the, the folks that they manage.
Uh, that's her general question. This is something we might talk about during uh, the discussion uh, period, but, but her idea is, well, why can't we do this? Why, can't, why couldn't we democratize the workplace in this way? What are the reasons against it? Okay, now what are some models of workplace democracy? Well, uh, the, there's three that she uh, discusses. One is collective bargaining, and this is where you, know, you have a union that uh, organizes all the workers and then bargains on their behalf for you know, pay and working conditions and all these kinds of things. Uh, that's one way to try to achieve voice uh, in the workplace, to have some, a say about uh, the terms of the employment contract. Uh, one thing she points out is that in the United States, uh, uh, conditions are now are such that they're, you know, the union presence is, is meager. Uh, you know, when, uh, when we discussed Blythe a few weeks back, we noted this as well. So here's, here are some of the statistics that she cites. Uh, back in 1954, about 28.3% of workers were represented by unions, and they you know, exchange, you know, entered into contracts with the employer in this way. As of the writing of her chapter two, it was 11.1% uh, of all workers. I think that number is actually lower uh, today because it's a few years since she wrote this chapter two. Uh, in Canada today, uh, we have about 31% of folks uh, represented by unions, whereas uh, it was 37% in 1982. So, you know, this, this trend is pushing the same direction for Canada as well, but just not, as, not nearly as quickly as in the States. Okay, so that's one way. Uh, and she, she notes actually a few worries about uh, this way of um, achieving workplace uh, democracy uh, or some measure of workplace department democracy. Uh, we can talk about that in the discussion section. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not, I'm not gonna say much about it here. She only spends a, f a few lines on that, but I, I think it's worth taking a look at if you have a chance. So a, a second model of workplace democracy is co-determination. And this is something that, this is, I think the way to describe this is, whereas collective bargaining is often uh, a bargain about the general scope of the employment contract, co-determination is a system in which the management and workers jointly make decisions about what the firm will do as a whole, like what kinds of things the firm will do as a matter of, a matter of strategy and so on. So it actually goes beyond just how much, uh, you know, making decisions together about how, and contracting about how, in a collective way, about how much the employees will get paid, or what the conditions will be like. Uh, this is a kind of system that you see uh, that, that Germany is known uh, for having. Um, now finally, and this is the, uh, probably the most uh, dramatic or significantly different or novel idea that she proposes, uh, we don't see quite as much as this in the contemporary workplace, is worker owned, is the creation of worker owned and managed firms, where they're actually, where, where actually the workers uh, are the folks who own the firm and they organize themselves to elect a cadre of management that's, you know, on a continual basis held accountable to the votes of the, of the workers. Um, that, that looks a lot more like a democracy that we're familiar with in the political sphere uh, adapted to the workplace. In the next two, in two of the readings that we're going to read later in the course, the Schweikert uh, reading and the reading on the democracy collaborative, we're going to talk a lot about this possibility, this possibility of worker-owned and, and managed firms as a way of avoiding domination in the workplace. Uh, uh, and ultimately, as we'll see, uh, domination in the political system at large. Okay. So that concludes uh, my discussion of uh, Anderson's private government. Uh, but let me just let me just read this last little bit, page seventeen seventy one of Anderson, just to sum up uh, what her punchline has been. You know, her question in chapter two has been, uh, you know, why it is that private government persists. Uh, in the workplace, when we take ourselves to be a, con uh, a people concerned with these values of equality and freedom, and added to the fact that government structures of any sort, you know, uh, pose a threat to those freedoms, particularly private governments. Uh, so she says, 
It is not my intention in this lecture to defend any particular model of worker participation in firm governance. My point is rather to expose a deep failure in current ways of thinking about how government fits into American lives. We do not live in the market society imagined by Payne and Lincoln, which offered an appealing vision of what a free society of equals could look like, combining individualistic libertarian and egalitarian ideals. Government is everywhere, not just in the form of the state, but even more pervasively in the workplace. Yet public discourse and much of political theory pretends that this is not so. It pretends that the constitution of workplace government is somehow the object of voluntary negotiation between workers and employers. This is only true for a tiny proportion of privileged workers. The vast majority are subject to private, authoritarian government, not through their own choice, but through laws that have handed nearly all authority to their employers. It is high time that public discourse acknowledged this reality and the cost to workers' freedom and dignity that private government imposes on them. It is high time that political theorists turn their attention to the private governments of the workplace. Since the levelers, egalitarian social movements have insisted that if government is necessary, it must be a public thing to all governed, accountable to them, responsive to their interests, and open to their participation. They were shrewd enough to recognize uh, the pervasiveness of private government in their lives. It is time to go back to the future in recovering such recognition and experimenting with ways to remedy it. The rest of the course, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to consider some other ways of tackling uh, this problem. Uh, but something I should add, not only this problem, as we'll see in later readings, there's this idea that the domination that occurs under private governments in the workplace uh, escapes from the confines of the workplace, and it, it threatens the the uh, democratic uh, nature of the political system as a whole. Uh, and the idea will be that that's what gets you something like uh, uh, what we see today uh, uh, with this, this kind of development that uh, Blythe uh, described that I had you folks read at the very beginning, where we move to you know progressively <laughs> more dominating political uh, uh, relationships uh, as a result of the way that our economic production is organized. That's the set of issues we're going to consider going forward in the course. Of course, in the discussion section, we're going to just talk about uh, Anderson and what she has to say about the uh, workplace and domination in the workplace and freedom and equality in the workplace. Thank you very much. <laughs>